Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for joining me today as we discuss unstoppable wellness, the five major ingredients of a truly unstoppable health and wellness program. My name is Dr. Jean Ketzelman, and I'm a doctor of physical therapy, certified applied prevention and health promotion therapist, certified strength and conditioning specialist, and I specialize in teaching people with chronic and unresolved pain or poor health the precise ways to reclaim their lives and achieve their goals. So before we begin, I'd just like to point out that the information that I'll be sharing today is based on what the research has shown to help the majority of people. But keep in mind that each person is an individual. So the content and information within this program is educational only and should not be relied upon for the purpose of replacing formal medical care. Please be sure to consult with a licensed healthcare provider if you are experiencing undiagnosed pain, poor health, illness, or other symptoms, or if your condition is either worsening or not improving. It's important to check with your doctor prior to starting any health practice or routine and do not discontinue or modify any medication or other physician recommendations prior to speaking to your physician. All right, so I'm sure it's safe to say that we are all striving to live a life of meaning and fulfillment. But what are the barriers to fulfillment? Why does it feel so hard sometimes? Well, there are two big things that we're gonna be discussing, right? So the first one is that you can't find meaning or fulfillment if you're not there, if you're physically absent, right? So if you're physically absent from your responsibilities, activities, or events, you're not gonna find meaning or fulfillment from them. On the other hand, maybe you are physically there, but you're not present. In this case, right, you're physically there, but you're unable to be the best version of yourself, your true self. So your true self isn't actually there, even though your physical self is. So what's the underlying cause? what leads us to either be absent or not present in our everyday life? And of course, the answer is poor wellness. And that's what we're talking about today. So the CDC has stated that six in 10 Americans live with at least one chronic disease, like heart disease and stroke, cancer or diabetes. These and other chronic diseases are the leading causes of death and disability in America. And they're also a leading driver of healthcare costs. Chronic diseases have significant health and economic costs in the United States. 90% of the nation's $3.5 trillion in annual healthcare expenditures are from people with chronic and mental health conditions. Right, so how does this impact being absent or not present? Well, when it comes to being absent, illness and or poor health may lead to time away from important and meaningful activities and events. On the other hand, maybe you can get there, maybe you can be physically present, but various negative health conditions may have a significantly negative impact on your ability to participate, focus and concentrate, learn, think clearly, be physically active, and experience enjoyment and happiness. So poor health may lead to exhaustion, anger, fear, anxiety, depression, and a lack of satisfaction and fulfillment from life. So the question is now, are we hopeless? Is this just how life is and we gotta learn to deal with it and there's nothing we can do? Well, no, of course not. That's why this presentation um, exists. That's why we're going through this today. The fact is we all have the power to make drastic changes in our personal health, wellness, and performance. And this program aims to prove it. 
right? So we all have a responsibility. The World Health Organization has stated that adopting a pessimistic attitude, some people believe that there is nothing that can be done. But in reality, the major causes of chronic diseases are known. And if these risk factors were eliminated, at least 80% of all heart disease, stroke, and type 2 diabetes would be prevented. Over 40% of cancer would be prevented. So the CDC also goes on to say, we know that most chronic diseases can be prevented by eating well, being physically active, avoiding tobacco and excessive drinking, and getting regular health screenings. All right, so now it's time to take action. Let's actually do something about everything that we've been talking about and learning. So in order to do that, I would like to introduce you to what I call the five convergent pillars of wellness and performance. The five areas that the research has shown to be among the most effective in being able to impact overall health, fulfillment, performance, and, and truly allowing you to get the most meaning out of your life. So we are going to go through each one of these five pillars in a moment. And the important thing to realize is that even though focusing on each one of these is already highly, highly beneficial, it's the ability to converge them all together that really brings about the most significant effects. So that will be the goal. Introduce these five and then bring it all together so you can really use it in your life. So the first pillar I'd like to talk about, kind of introduce you to, is called state, which is really just the balance between stress and recovery. So in order to understand why we begin with state and why stress matters so much, we need to understand how the stress or how stress influences a part of our nervous system known as the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is a part of our nervous system that impacts the automatic functions of our body. It's a part of our nervous system that helps control the things that we're not really conscious of and they're always happening in the background. So for instance, hormonal balance, immune function, cardiovascular health and circulation, respiratory health, digestive and urinary health, electrolyte balance, nervous system function, physical healing from trauma and injury, and physical and emotional pain. All of these are influenced by the autonomic nervous system and stress directly influences the autonomic nervous system. So to understand how all of this works, we need to understand that there are two sides of the autonomic nervous system, two divisions. The one side, is the sympathetic, and the other part is the parasympathetic. The sympathetic is the part of the nervous system that's known as the fight, flight, or freeze. That's the stress response. So sympathetic is the stress, fight, flight, or freeze. Parasympathetic is the recovery, rest, digest, and recover. So there are two sides of the same coin, and they work to balance each other out. One is not more important than the other, and we'll see that in a moment. It's not like stress is all bad and recovery is all good. No, we need stress in, in certain situations, and we need to then recover. And the goal is to balance all of those out. So in order to understand how stress impacts our health, let's go through what actually happens during a sympathetic fight, flight, or freeze response, what's actually going on. So when you're in the stress response, our alertness initially goes up. Adrenaline comes out, begins to be released. Our pupils will dilate because our bodies know, our brains know, we need to see the important thing. Something is going on, right? There's a situation, a challenge in front of us, and we want to make sure that we see the important stuff so we know how to deal with it. So our pupils will dilate. Then our vigilance goes up. Vigilance is this ability to look for and see all of the things that may go wrong or that may be wrong. So you're constantly on the lookout. 
right? So now think about that. In a short-term stressor, that's a very good and important thing. We need to be able to do that, right? If something's going on, we need to see all the potential dangers and know how to deal with it. But long-term stress, those in long-term chronic stress will often feel like everything is wrong and everything is out to get them, right? And that's not just paranoia or there's something wrong with them or, or there's something wrong with their head. No, this is how we're built in a fight, flight, or freeze situation where we are constantly in that sympathetic response. If we're there for a long time, we're always vigilant. Our brains are looking for the things that may go wrong to help protect us. That's normal, right? We just need to realize that it's very useful in the short term for like short term stress, but we don't want to be there for a long period of time. We don't want to be there chronically. So then also with this increased alertness, we are more sensitive in general. We, we can feel more because we need to make sure that we can deal with all the stressors that are going on around us. And the interesting thing with pain is that a very um, quick stressor or a very, um, like a stressor in the moment, a short-term stressor may actually decrease our pain, but chronic stress may actually make us more sensitive to pain and may have us feel the pain more so than maybe normal. So then moving on to the cardiovascular system, in a sympathetic response or a stress response, our heart rate goes up, which is very good in the short term because we need to deal with the stressor, it gives us more energy, brings blood to where we need it to go. That's great. But when stress is there for a long period of time, that is very hard on our heart and can impact our heart health. Then when it comes to blood vessels, what's interesting is that what our bodies do, what our body does is that in a stressful situation, our brain unconsciously, without us realizing it, will determine what parts of our body need more blood in order to survive, right? What are the more important areas? And then it also determines what are the less important areas, and then it takes blood away from there. So it'll bring blood to where it needs to, and it'll take blood away from other areas. And it's all about trying to overcome the challenge. It's whatever your brain thinks needs to be done in that moment to overcome the challenge. So it does this by increasing and decreasing your blood vessel thickness, right, or size. So if the body determines that an area doesn't need as much blood or isn't as important at that moment, it'll decrease the blood vessel um, and it'll, it'll constrict it, right? And that's where the high blood pressure comes in. That's what's often associated with the high blood pressure, the constriction of the blood vessels. So then moving on, it also impacts our breathing. And we'll talk more about breathing as we move forward, but during stressful situations, it'll lead us to breathe faster and more shallow. Now, let's talk a little bit about the digestive system. So this is directly related to what we talked about with blood vessels, and this is how it's gonna be more practical, and you'll see what I mean in a moment. So during a stressful response, typically digestion is not considered essential for survival of the stressful situation. So what happens is that less blood is brought to the digestive system. It's brought to other areas of the body, but it's taken away from the digestive system, which then may lead to worse function of your digestive system. That's why so many people in that, that feel stress for long periods of time or under this um, stressful response have, have issues with digestive health, right? Because the organ simply cannot function as well under the stressful situation. Then let's move on to talking about hormones. So stress impacts many hormones, but I'd like to talk about a few in particular. We've all heard about cortisol and how that is a stress hormone, right? But why and what does it do? So, Cortisol is not all bad. There are good 
things to cortisol. And one thing I want to talk about in particular is that cortisol actually brings, actually ha, um, allows your body to put more sugar into the bloodstream. So cortisol signals the body to put more sugar into the bloodstream. Why? Right, sugar is one of our most effective and quickest energy sources. So in a stressful situation, we need more energy to overcome the stressor. So our body knows we're gonna release cortisol to then help improve or help increase how much sugar we're putting into our blood for more energy. In the short term, that's great, right? We need that energy. But in the long term, if this is happening over and over and you have chronic stress, then that can lead to issues with blood sugar regulation, where the blood sugar is chronically high, can lead to issues with insulin and potentially even diabetes, right? So a very, very close relationship between diabetes and this chronic stress. And then finally, stress directly influences our immune system. In the short term, a quick stressor actually helps to decrease inflammation, but in the long term, it actually ends up resulting in increased inflammation, chronically increased inflammation. And we'll talk about the impact of inflammation in later pillars, but just remember that this chronic stress can increase chronic inflammation. And so finally, overall chronic stress will reduce immune strength and function in the long run. So as you can see, stress itself isn't all bad. It's very, very, like the stress response isn't all bad. It's very good and useful in the short term. But, in the, but if it's there for a long period of time, if it's there chronically, that's where the health issues come in. So again, short-term stress, that's not necessarily an issue the long-term stress, the stress that's going on and on and on, that can really impact our overall health. So the ability to manage your state, the ability to manage your stress can result in reduced anxiety, worry, fear, procrastination, exhaustion, burnout. And the ability to uh, manage your state can also result in greater mental clarity, creativity, productivity, physical health and performance, and satisfaction and fulfillment from daily activities. So let's talk a little bit about what we can actually do about this. So this is all great. Now we understand how our nervous system works and how and what happens with chronic stress and why it's important to be able to go into the parasympathetic rest, digest, and recover piece. But how, right? What can we do? So what I'd like to talk about now is the power of breath. Research is quite clear in being able to show that breath can directly influence our state, our balance between stress and recovering. Now we've all heard that, oh, if you're stressed, just take a deep breath, you need to breathe. And that's true, but that's not really saying the whole story. It's not just about take a breath. It's how do you take a breath? What do you actually do? There is a more specific way to be able to utilize breath to really get the benefit that you're after. And so I'd like to share that with you now. So remember, before we start again, sympathetic is the stress fight or flight, parasympathetic is the recovery. And the way we breathe influences, helps to influence which one of those we're going more towards. So first, let's talk about breathing through the mouth versus breathing through the nose. By breathing through the mouth, that actually is more associated with the sympathetic stress response, right? So picture somebody that's either hyperventilating or having a panic attack. It is very rare that they're going to be breathing with their mouth closed and through their mouth. They usually have the mouth open and really gasping for air. That is a stressful response. On the other hand, breathing calmly through the nose is more so associated with the rest, digest, recover, parasympathetic nervous system. So now let's move on to using the chest versus using the belly. 
when you breathe in, what's the big, what's the thing that expands the most? The chest or the belly? Well, the chest is more associated with the sympathetic stress response. Again, think of somebody that's having a panic attack or hyperventilating. They're usually breathing a lot through the chest and shoulders. You can really see their shoulders coming up and down and their chest rising. That is a very large stress response. On the other hand, if the shoulders are completely relaxed, not much movement happening in the upper body, and it's just movement through the belly in the diaphragm, that is more so of that parasympathetic rest, digest, and recover. Finally, the last piece is the speed at which you breathe. The faster you breathe, the more sympathetic stress you're going to encourage, while the slower you breathe, it's going to be more on the parasympathetic rest, digest, and recover. So these are the three big pieces to consider when really trying to use your breath to affect your state, right? So I often get the question, what happens if I can't breathe through my nose? What if my nose is always stuffed and I can only breathe through my mouth? What do I do then? So there are a couple of things that we can speak about with that. Number one, of course, do your best. Practice breathing through your nose when you can. But if that's very stressful, if breathing through your nose is so difficult that it becomes stressful, then the next recommendation is that the goal is for us to use as many of these three as possible. If you can't breathe through the nose and you can only breathe through the mouth, at least try to work on breathing through the belly and breathing slower, right? If you can just do those, that's already very beneficial. So if you can't do all three out of the two, uh, all three out of the three, try to do at least two out of the three. And if you can't do two out of the three, at least try to do one out of the three and then gradually add another one and then gradually add another one if you can. So just to review, in order to get that parasympathetic rest, digest, recover, you want to inhale and exhale through the nose, keep the mouth closed, tongue on the roof of the mouth, and then use your diaphragm. The belly expands on the inhale. So think you're bringing air in and your belly is like a balloon and expands when you inhale and the belly goes down when you exhale. So to leave off this pillar, just like to point out, please value your breath. Realize the power that your breath has to really influence your health. All right, so now we've gotten to our next pillar, nutrition, looking at diet and hydration. So to understand why nutrition is so important, we're going to be looking at the role of nutrition on immune function. So the research has shown that one of the most important medical discoveries of the past two decades has been that the immune system and inflammatory processes are involved in not just a few select disorders, but a wide variety of mental and physical health problems that dominate present day morbidity and mortality worldwide. Indeed, chronic inflammatory diseases have been recognized as the most significant cause of death in the world today, with more than 50% of all deaths being attributable to inflammation-related diseases, such as ischemic heart disease, stroke, cancer, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and autoimmune and neurodegenerative conditions. So, let's talk a little bit about inflammation, right? Inflammation, again, is not all bad. In the short term, inflammation is a very good and useful thing. Inflammation is our immune system coming out to try to fight whatever is going on. The issue that comes in is when the inflammation has been there for a long period of time. Just like how we talked about when stress is there for long periods of time, it's not good for you. But in the short term, stress can be very good depending on the situation. Same thing with inflammation. In the short term, it has its purpose and it's there to fight off whatever is going on. But in the long term, when we have a lot of inflammation, it may lead to a lot of these chronic diseases 
listed here that I just previously listed a moment ago, right? So research is showing that nutrition has a direct role in this inflammation. So this paper here concludes that our results provide strong and consistent support for the hypothesis that a pro-inflammatory diet is associated with increased all-cause mortality. This means that a diet that increases inflammation is associated with increasing the likelihood of death from any cause. Now, on the other hand, the good news is that they've also found that an anti-inflammatory diet was mainly, um, an anti-inflammatory diet is able to help decrease those effects and an anti-inflammatory diet is mainly plant-based, rich in vegetables, fruits, fish, nuts, and legumes, and low in meats, dairy, and bakery. So again, high inflammatory diet may increase the likelihood of death from any cause, while a low inflammatory diet, which, are the, which include the things that I just listed, help to decrease that likelihood. So let's talk a little bit about how, nutri how high sugar and processed foods specifically impact our health. So highly processed foods and sugars are highly inflammatory, which we discussed is a, plays a big role in our overall health, and they also raise blood sugar quickly. Now, why is this important? Why is raising blood sugar quickly important? Well, sugar is the main energy source needed for our brains to, make, to remain alert. And it's difficult to concentrate and manage our moods when blood sugar is low. So what happens is when there is a large increase in blood sugar quickly, so when you have highly processed foods or sugars, there is a quick increase in blood sugar. And that large and rapid increase in blood sugar often results in a burst of energy followed by a miserable slump. And that, again, affects your ability to be present. Remember, you may be there, but you're not really there. Your true self, your best self isn't there, right? You, you feel absolutely miserable with this slump. So, here on the screen, I'm showing the food pyramid that I'm sure many of us have seen in the past. But did you know that this is no longer the recommendation, right? This is not the way that it is recommended to eat and, and to um, structure your diet any longer. So let's think about why for a moment here. If you look at the pyramid, what seems to be at the base and, and the biggest section? Well, it's bread, cereal, rice, and pasta. But what do we just learn? A, a lot of these foods that are listed there are, are processed. And processed foods may very well be highly inflammatory and can also increase blood sugar, right? So, or increase blood sugar too rapidly. So this is no longer the main recommendation where that is the base of the pyramid. Here is the new recommendation for optimal nutrition, right? This is Harvard's um, uh, healthy eating plate, and this is how they illustrate to be what the research shows um, to be among the most healthy ways to structure your nutritional program for the majority of people. So if you look here, half of the plate is going to be fruits and vegetables, with the majority of the half being vegetables. And remember that fruits and vegetables are highly anti-inflammatory. Now on the other half of the plate, half of that half will be whole grains and the other half will be healthy proteins, right? So healthy proteins, they can be fish, poultry, beans for anybody that is vegetarian or vegan, and they suggest to limit red meat and cheese, avoid bacon, cold cuts, and other processed meats. Remember, the processing is the processed foods are some of the leading issues when it comes to nutrition and health. All right, moving on, we're going on to our next pillar movement. 
where we're going to focus on developing fitness as well as just staying active throughout the day. So the World Health Organization has stated that physical inactivity or insufficient physical activity is one of the leading risk factors for non-communicable diseases and death worldwide to individuals, the failure to enjoy adequate levels of physical activity increases the risk of cancer, heart disease, stroke, and diabetes by 20 to 30% and shortens lifespan by three to five years. Moreover, physical inactivity burdens society through the hidden and growing costs of medical care and loss of productivity. So, the research is quite clear on this. Conclusive and overwhelming scientific evidence exists for physical inactivity as a primary and actual cause of most chronic diseases. So when it comes to the research, what has physical act what does physical activity show to influence? So first it influences physical health and performance. Um, proper physical activity shows to reduce excess body fat, increase lean muscle mass, balance and control metabolism, improve circulation, manage blood sugar and improve insulin sensitivity, boost the immune system, reduce inflammation, and diminish pain. On the other hand, also, it helps to enhance mental health and performance. So physical activity has shown to improve learning and memorization, improve focus, boost creativity, control and diminish anxiety, fight off depression and reduce inflammation again. I know that we, I mentioned it twice, but that impacts the physical health and the mental health. So what's the dosage? How much movement do we really need? So what the research is showing is that the recommendation is a total of 100 to 150 to 300 minutes per week of moderate intensity exercise. So that's combined. We want to combine 150 to 300 minutes per week of moderate intensity exercise. Ideally, three to five days per week of aerobic exercise and two days per week of strength training resistance exercise. Now, when it comes to the 150 to the 300 minutes, in order to count time towards it, it should be, the session should be at least 10 minutes. So you can put, as long as you are moving at a moderate intensity for at least 10 minutes, you can count that time towards the 150 to 300. And, and again, ideally, you want to be able to actually use some form of exercise in that count where it's three to five days of aerobic and two days of resistance. The other piece is to maintain proper sitting, standing and lifting technique and to change postures and positions within every 30 to 60 minutes throughout the day, such as when you're at work. So some kind of movement, um, we are not just staying in one spot for too long. So let's talk a little bit about how to use movement to allow you to be more present, again, to, to be the best version of yourself wherever you are. So when sitting, change postures or positions within every three to 60, 30 to 60 minutes. When possible, move and walk at least every two to three hours throughout the day. Then deliberately increase physical activity demands during normal everyday tasks. So for instance, take the stairs instead of the elevator, park at the back of the parking lot, right? Go for a stroll around the block at lunchtime and avoid asking others to help get you something or bring you something. You want to use every opportunity to move. By having people do things for you, you're, you're missing an opportunity to improve your health and wellness. So don't rob yourself of that opportunity. Then also perform some form of physical movement or activity prior to important activities or events and tasks requiring increased focus, memorization, creativity, or problem solving. So that increased movement before those kind of events um, can really help improve your concentration, your focus, and your overall performance. 
So the next pillar that we're going to talk about is sleep. So we want to make sure that we are maximizing restful sleep. So let's look at the research. What, why is sleep so important? What effect does it have? So the research has shown that sleep has a direct connection with our cardiovascular health, our immune health, hormonal health, our DNA, our learning and memory, and all-cause mortality, which is, again, death from any reason, right? So that's what sleep has an influence over. So the research looked at how much sleep do we really need? What, what's the recommendation and, and how much is enough? How little is too little? What are the numbers? So what the research is showing is that six to nine hours of deep and uninterrupted sleep is, I, is what we're going for. Seven to eight hours is what's recommended and eight hours is best. These are the average numbers for the majority of people. So here are just some recommendations. You may have heard these before, but I'd just like to review them because these are the ones that have really been shown to help and work. So first, try to limit the following. Limit falling asleep in front of TV electronics, on the couch or recliner, or in rooms other than the bedroom. You want to limit performing any kind of work or stress increasing tasks about an hour and a half to two hours prior to bed. Remember, anything that's stressful is gonna bring on that sympathetic fight or flight part of your nervous system, which is the direct opposite of the rest and digest. So remember, rest and digest. That's the part that's gonna help you sleep. So if you're in that sympathetic fight or flight, it's not going to help you get restful sleep. Then you want to limit exposure to bright lights and electronics one and a half to two hours prior to bed. So there's been research showing that the bright lights, when going through our eyes, they mimic sunlight. And sunlight has a very direct impact on our circadian rhythm. And by constantly looking at these bright lights before bed, it can interfere with our circadian rhythm. And so we may not be feeling prepared to go to bed and not wanting to sleep. Right? And then finally, limit eating directly before bed. So what you do want to do, what you want to replace those things with is the following. When possible, aim to finish dinner no less than two to three hours prior to planned bedtime. And then perform recovery-based activities after, um, after eating, right? So be before bed, I, there's a mistype on this slide, but you want to perform the recovery-based activities after dinner and before bed. So some of those include the following. You can read or journal, which work really well, but only if they're a physical book or journal, not an electronic one. Again, you don't wanna be looking at anything that has bright lights. And then the other one is diaphragmatic breathing or meditation. And we spoke about the influence breathing has earlier in this presentation. So if you use those techniques and use it right before bed, they can help calm down the nervous system and bring you into that parasympathetic rest and digest. And finally, you want to make sure that you're sleeping in the bedroom and you want to maintain a cooler room temperature. So many suggest somewhere between 65 to 72 degrees is often helpful in terms of allowing you to sleep well. Okay, so moving on to our final pillar, and that is connection. So we will be looking at community, relationships, and support. So there's been a large wealth of research coming out showing the impact that connection has on overall health and well being. So the research shows that there are dangers with low social connection or or feelings of isolation and loneliness. And the dangers are higher inflammation at the cellular level, higher susceptibility to anxiety and depression, slower recovery from disease, increased antisocial behavior and violence, and increased incidence of suicide. 
On the other hand, if you have strong connections, then that's a 50% increased chance of longevity, stronger gene expression for immunity, lower rates of anxiety and depression, and it promotes social, emotional, emotional and physical well-being. So the prescription for this pillar is to develop strong and meaningful connections. So how do we do that? First, let's look at what we're trying to connect with. There are four big pieces that we want to connect with. So we want to be connected with ourselves, make sure that we have a strong connection with ourselves, with the environment and with others. And then finally, we wanna make sure that we're connected to this moment. So let's talk about that a little bit more. The essential skill of connection can be seen as mindfulness. Right now, mindfulness is a big buzz term. Everybody's talking about mindfulness and, and many in, in, in terms of meditation, which is absolutely fantastic. And I also include that very often when I work with people one-on-one, -on -one. make sure that mindfulness is a big piece in what we work on. But what is mindfulness? So mindfulness isn't just meditation, even though when you meditate, you can practice mindfulness. Mindfulness is purposeful and non-judgmental awareness of the present moment. That means that you are paying attention to what is going on right now in this moment on purpose and without judgment. That ability is essential for connection. If you're not here in this moment, if your mind is somewhere else, whether you're talking to somebody to somebody else and you're connecting with someone else, if you're out in nature, whatever it is, if you are somewhere else with your mind and you're not here, you can't connect, right? Like you need to be there to be able to connect. And that's why mindfulness meditation will help to develop that skill. But the goal of the meditation is then to develop the skill to be able to use that in everyday life, not just while you're sitting in meditation, but to use mindfulness in day-to-day -day life. Once that's established and you have a sense of mind, some sense of mindfulness, now training mindfulness, that never really ends. You will always be practicing mindfulness. It's not like there's an end goal with that, but beginning to develop mindfulness then there are two big superpowers, things that I like to call the two big superpowers of connection. So once you're present, once you are there, now it's a matter of connecting to the positives and the negatives. In any situation, there are the good and the not so good. Now, when things are good, you want to connect through gratitude. Practice gratitude in those moments of the good. And then in the not so good situations, connect through compassion. If anybody's going through difficult times, if you're going through difficult times, practice compassion. So both of these, gratitude and compassion in the research have shown to have very powerful health benefits. They help to promote the parasympathetic nervous system, reduce stress and decrease inflammation. So by practicing gratitude and compassion in the good and not so good parts of life and being able to stay present, you're truly able to connect. So with connection, I'd like to leave off that sometimes we all need a little bit of help. So it's important to keep up with regular, regularly scheduled health screenings in terms of our health, right? Do not hesitate to get professional help when needed. That's very important for our health. All right, so we've come to the point where it's time to piece it all together. Let's put everything we have learned together into practice. So quickly to review, we've gone through the five convergent pillars of wellness and performance. State, nutrition, sleep, movement, and connection. So remember with state, it's all about balancing stress and recovery. Both are important. It's not that stress is all bad and recovery is all good. It's all about balancing between the two. Then with nutrition, the focus is on 
whole foods and trying to avoid a lot of processed foods and sugars. Those are the big pieces with nutrition. And then when possible, trying to get enough fruits and vegetables and nuts and legumes as those have been highly anti-inflammatory and can help um, with chronic disease, right? So now next one is sleep. We want to make sure that we are getting our seven to eight hours of truly good restful sleep. When it comes to movement, we want to make sure that we are moving throughout the week, we're staying active, um, avoiding being still for too long, and when possible, trying to get at least three days of some kind of aerobic exercise and at least two days of some kind of resistance exercise when possible. And then finally, we want to prioritize connection, making sure that we are connecting with ourselves, connecting with others, and connecting with our environment. And it's very important that we know how to be present in the moment and to practice gratitude for the good in our life and compassion for those times that are difficult. So the path to unstoppable wellness begins with recognizing your responsibility. Now, responsibility is often a term that nobody wants to really think about or go into, but, but let's look at what responsibility really is. Responsibility is simply your ability to respond, your ability to act, right? That's responsibility. So first, recognize that you have this ability to respond. Everything that we've talked about hopefully has shown that you have so much more power than you may have realized. Right? We all have this ability to do something about our health, and we need to recognize that. The next piece is to become educated. Now that we know there's something that we can do, we want to become educated. And again, this was hopefully this presentation kind of began that process to see what's out there, to know what you may be able to do. Next, determine the plan with everything that you've learned. Start putting together a plan and if there's anything that, um, that you need help with or any, reach out to me, reach out to other healthcare providers, but make sure they have a nice, strong plan in place to really get control of your health. And the last piece is to take action. This presentation, everything I've taught, everything I've talked about is completely worthless if you don't take action. The only thing that matters is what you do with this information, right? Like the presentation itself, this information itself is nothing. It doesn't mean anything. What matters is what you do with this information. So the last piece, the part that is really going to help with health is to actually put these practices into action. So I'd like to close off by just saying if there's anything that I can help anybody with. If anybody has any questions or anything that you'd like to discuss, please don't hesitate to reach out. I'm always happy to answer questions, to discuss, and to help in any way I can. All right. So on this page, you can see my website, my address for my physical therapy and wellness practice and my phone number and my email. All of those are great ways to reach out to me. So please don't hesitate to reach out if there's anything at all that I can help you with. So finally, I'd just like to leave off with this note. Wellness is not just about avoiding disease. It's about living a fulfilling and meaningful life, a well-lived life and ultimately leaving a lasting impact on all of those you touch along the way. So thank you very much. And again, if anybody needs anything, I am here. So please don't hesitate to reach out.